Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. This is part three of the Manson Family series. Now I know it took some time because I went on vacation and a lot of things happened to prevent this from getting out before now, but here it is. There will be a part four to follow and there will also be a bonus part after. Kind of a little surprise and a thank you for being so patient and bearing with me through my trials and tribulations. So I would really like to chat with you about how my vacation went, all the cool things that happened, the funny things that happened. It was definitely an experience, but I am making a vlog, um, an April vlog for you guys. So it'll be basically everything that happened in the month of April, and I'm compiling all of that into one vlog. And I will probably be doing that every month, just putting out one vlog a month that kind of just puts the entire month into one video. So keep an eye out for that, and we will chat a little bit more in that video. But right now, I wanna dive right in. And I want to get started because we have so much to cover and I also have an exciting new sponsor to talk to you guys about. I am so excited to be working with this company. I think it fits into what we do and what we talk about here so well. And not only that, but it is actually something that I personally use, I personally believe in, and I personally love and have so much fun with. I know I have told you guys in the past that I will never accept a sponsorship or promote any brand that I don't personally believe in 100% myself. And Hunt a Killer is one of the things that I actually really enjoy, really love. It's a lot of fun and I'm so glad to be working with them and having them sponsor this video. Hunt a Killer is a murder mystery subscription box where a detective enlists your help in solving a murder. This detective sends you a box with letters, documents, clues, and evidence every month. And with each box, you'll be able to eliminate a suspect and get one step closer to cracking the case. Each box is considered an episode that's part of a six month long season. You can order the boxes only one at a time, or you can get a discount and order the six month season pass. What's really cool about Hunt Killer is that there's an online community and there's online resources available to you. So there's Facebook groups and I'm part of them and you can go on there and chat with people if you're stuck on something. But personally, I love doing this with Nev and we just started our new season. So I'm actually going to play you some clips of Nev and I opening our first box and getting started on the first season and we had so much fun. We have this board that we kind of keep everything together on, try to put all the clues. In this specific box, it was so fun because it's the murder of a guy at his high school class reunion and all of his friends are suspects, right? And there's obviously other suspects, but they give you a yearbook and you kind of have to look through it and see everybody's quote and see what everybody wrote in the yearbook. You have newspaper clippings that you have to look through. You have a black light that you have to kind of like shine on everything and see if anything pops up. You've got the entire case file, which looks really realistic and has a lot of details in there that you kind of have to sift through. It is so much fun. Nev and I love doing it together. I think it's really something fun to do with someone, but also if you want to do it alone and you guys are interested, I will start opening my boxes on a live, um, maybe once or twice a month and kind of go over those clues and we can discuss it together. Nev would love to do it with me. I know she would because she would actually be mad if I did it without her because we are really into solving this case right now. Put the hunt a killer pin on that way. All other hunt a killer. Oh, you've already got a bunch of pins on. Yeah. Wow, okay. This just fits. All right. So we're going to put that on that way when you're out in the real world and are the, anybody else is <laughs> hunting for killers. They'll know they'll that know. you are also a killer hunter. So let me know if you guys are interested in that. Either way, I'm going to place the link in the description box. If you want to start off with one box, that's fine. I think it's more fun to do the season pass because you're going to want the other boxes anyways, because it's, it's so detailed and so much like a spider web of information. It's not 
a simple thing that you're gonna solve and open the box and figure out in five or 10 minutes. Nav and I have been working on this first box, trying to get everything because we're both perfectionists when it comes to that kind of stuff, trying to get all the information out and trying to get all the details out for over a week now. So it definitely takes time, but it's so, so much fun. Who signed it? I don't know. We should do a handwriting analysis, but based on, it looks like Artie. No. You don't think so? Artie is Arthur. You did a pretty good job as no, Danny. No, different eyes. Yeah. But you know who has eyes like that? Thorne. Antonio, who Thorne. we know he sat with. And also, the P's are consistent. Oh, so are the eyes. So are the T's. Those big old T's. Okay, Antonio. Okay, Antonio, we see you. That's what we in the biz like to call oh. laundering money. High five. We rock. Wow, that was a really aggressive high five. I so I'm gonna place the link there, and if you wanna get 20% off of your first box, use the code HARLOW, H-A-R-L-O-W-E. Thank you guys so much for listening. Let's get right into the video. Okay, so by this time, the family had sort of migrated to Spawn Ranch, and they were living mostly at Dennis Wilson's, but they also had Spawn Ranch as a sort of base that they could all meet back up at. Spawn Movie Ranch was 55 acres of property used as a backdrop for some B-list Westerners in the 50s. They had discovered it during their travels when their bus broke down near the Simi Valley and they needed somewhere to regroup and repair it. The ranch had to have been the coolest place ever. An actual movie set made up of some storefronts, also some complete buildings, one of those being a saloon. There was also plenty of space and it was the kind of offbeat environment that Charlie and his family could carry out their business, which included using the set to play act. You couldn't find some place that was more separated from reality than the movie set. The owner, George Spawn, was 80 years old and going blind, and he let Manson and his followers live there for free in exchange for labor, like daily chores and helping run the horse rental business he operated on the property. It was also rumored that the girls worked in Spawn's personal space, like his own home, especially Lynette Squeaky From One of the duties she was tasked with was to keep the old pervert sufficiently happy at all times, if you know what I mean. This is actually where Lynette Squeaky got her nickname because George would often pinch her butt and her thighs and she would give off these little squeaks. So George called her Squeaky, which the rest of the family thought was funny and it stuck. But the family was staying for the majority of the time at Dennis Wilson's. They had a pool, they had running water, they had electricity. Dennis was generous. He made sure they always had enough food and alcohol and drugs. And in return, Charlie would make sure that Dennis and his friends were well taken care of by his girls. They never said no, although I don't think they were given much of a choice. Even though Dennis Wilson always had Manson's back and he defended him and he tried to get him signed, Charlie eventually became frustrated with Dennis's lack of ability to do so. And he realized that dealing with the artists themselves wasn't as effective as dealing with the businessmen who actually made the decisions. Terry Melcher and his girlfriend, Candace Burgeon, rented a residence at the top of Cielo Drive in the Benedict Canyon area, which boasted a fantastic view of Los Angeles laid out in all its twinkling majesty at their feet. Melcher had played in some bands as a teenager, but mostly lived off of his mother, Doris Day's name and fame, until he caught a break at the age of 22 when he was made a producer at Columbia Records, a company that his mother owned quite a bit of stock in. He was the youngest producer on the label, and he proved that he had more to offer than his mother's name, producing more than 80 chart hits for Columbia. Manson pretty much thought that he would be signed by Terry Melcher immediately, since Terry Melcher was now in the position to sign whoever he wanted. He had proved that he knew what it took and he could pick out a really talented artist or band. And he was tight with Dennis Wilson and Greg Jacobson. They had been friends since they were young. But Terry Melcher was a businessman first and foremost, and he hadn't grown up blue collar like Jacobson and Dennis Wilson had. He had grown up with a famous mother and he didn't trust strangers and he didn't bring home strays. 
There was no way he was going to ruin his spotless track record by signing somebody he didn't 100% believe in, even if his friends had his back and vouched for him. He didn't think that Manson had that something special, that commercial thing that would make the label a crap ton of money. Maybe he would appeal to smaller audiences or niche groups, but he didn't have that nationwide Beatles kind of draw that would bring in the money that Terry was known for bringing in. Terry Melcher always kept Charlie Manson at an arm's length. He was polite and he was courteous, but he wasn't the kind of guest that Terry would invite to his home. Terry Melcher had brought into his adulthood the kind of privacy that he saw as the child of a star and as a child star himself. He kept everybody kind of away from the private areas of his home, even his own guests, even his own friends. He wanted everything to be separate, his personal life and his public life. But Charlie was really annoyed by this because Melcher did throw these epic parties at his Cielo Drive home. All the biggest names in the industry would be there and these were the kinds of people that Manson really wanted to get in front of. And just being invited to one of these parties at Terry Melcher's home would have given him access to so many of these people. It really pissed him off that Terry didn't feel comfortable enough with him like Dennis Wilson did to invite him into his home. And the only reason that he even knew where Terry Melcher lived was because Dennis Wilson drove Terry home one day and Manson came along. It was pretty clear to Charlie and everyone else that Terry Melcher didn't care to know Charlie Manson in any other capacity than a casual acquaintance. Melcher did, however, take quite a liking to Ruth Ann Morehouse, who was also greatly liked by Greg Jacobson, and he had no problem bringing Ruth Ann to his home. He even suggested that he would move Ruth Ann into his house as a housekeeper, which his girlfriend, Candy Bergen, quickly put a stop to. She may have known what her boyfriend was doing on the side, but she definitely wasn't gonna have it moved right into her house and live under her nose. Once he was shunned by Melcher, Charlie just kept trying to get closer to Dennis Wilson. They shared this secret racism. They both were kind of racist and they both had an interest in keeping that under wraps, but together they felt that they could talk about it openly. Dennis and Manson had their own safe space when it came to discussing racism. Obviously, Wilson wanted to keep his distaste for blacks under wraps because he was a public figure, and Charlie didn't want his family to know that he was racist because he preached everybody that all people were equal. Everybody was the same. So he couldn't have them knowing his actual views because it went against everything that he taught them. He also tried to isolate Dennis Wilson from his brothers and his bandmates, saying out loud what Wilson already kind of suspected inside his own head, that they thought he was a joke and they wouldn't let him write songs because they didn't take him seriously. And Charlie hated how everyone called him and his followers hippies. He said they weren't hippies, they were slippies. Hippies were pacifists and there was great violence and upheaval coming that these softies would not survive. He said they were slippies because they were able to slip through the cracks of society. Soon enough, the group would attract more male followers, which was important to Charlie, remember, because he did not value women as intelligent beings. He needed men around to talk about manly things with, kind of like that little small town where he was brought up by his aunt and uncle in, where they had really strict gender roles. I think he was more influenced by that than he thought. Charles Watson, or Tex, came to find the family through Dennis Wilson. Dennis met Tex one day when he was out hitchhiking, and I mean Dennis Wilson was hitchhiking, and Tex Watson picked him up. Even though Dennis Wilson had more than one car, more than enough money, it was still kind of cool in those days, in those times, to hitchhike. It brought you closer to the people. Even though Dennis Wilson was rich and famous, he wanted people to think that he was like everybody else. He wanted himself to think that he was like everybody else because that was the times. Everybody's equal. I'm not better than you just because I got lucky and got a record deal. So it was something that he did, even though he owned a Mercedes, to hitchhike every so often. 
So Tex Watson is a controversial figure. <laughs> and we will discuss that more later. But pretty much he is sometimes painted as this small town, Texas kid, honor student, athlete, and Charlie Manson completely corrupted him. But Tex Watson was on his way to being corrupted far before he fell in with the Manson family. Tex was from Copeville, Texas, and during high school, he was an athlete and an honor student. He grew up Methodist in a family that told him that in order to reach his goals, he had to work hard, get an education, and lead a moral life. After graduating from high school, Watson chose to go to North Texas State University in Denton. Now, Denton was very different from the small town that he grew up in, Copeville. And a lot of people believe that this is where Tex Watson started to kind of go off the path. This is where he became involved with the party scene and drugs. Now, to make some money, Tex ended up taking a job as a baggage handler for an airline company. And part of his payment, I guess, included free airline tickets, which is awesome, by the way. And he used these airline tickets to travel all over the country. One of these places he went to was California to visit a friend. And when he got to California, he fell in love and he never wanted to leave, so he didn't. Now, Tex did try to keep going to school and get that education and lead that moral life that his family had taught him to, to do, but he ended up dropping out. I mean, like we've talked about before, this was the 1960s in California. Everybody was in the free love, hippie, psychedelic drug thing. Everybody was just trying to do as many drugs and have as much sex as possible. So I imagine it was very hard to get a college education during this time. So he ended up dropping out so he could enjoy life. And that is when he found Dennis Wilson waiting on the side of the road to be picked up and entwining their fates together forever. Now, according to Tex Watson, he was just driving down Sunset and you know hikers were pretty common on Sunset Boulevard. He pulled over to pick this guy up. The guy got in and was like, hey, my name's Dennis Wilson. And Tex was like, okay, hey, Dennis Wilson. And then Wilson was like, I'm one of the Beach Boys, you know? Like he had to let him know because Tex didn't know who he was. And then obviously Tex Watson was very impressed. You know, you lucked out when you pick up a rich and famous recording artist as a hitchhiker instead of a murderer. Now, obviously Dennis Wilson has Tex drop him off at home to his mansion. And when Tex Watson pulls up to Dennis Wilson's house, he's like, whoa, this place is legit. Like it's huge. There's cars parked outside. There's parties going on. There's girls all over the place. Like this is awesome. Tex Watson was dropping Dennis off and he thought, you know, he's just gonna drop this guy off and then go on his way. But Dennis Wilson invites Tex Watson into his house because that's what he did. That's what he did. He just picked up or had other people pick him up and then he's like, hey, you know, come in. And like I've said before, this is a great ideology that everybody gets along, everybody's friends. You can pick somebody up on the side of the road and invite them in for dinner and then make a lifelong friend and that's great. However, we don't live in a world where that really always works out too well. And in this case, you bring together Tex Watson, who I believe has his own issues aside from Charlie Manson, and Manson, who we all know is a psychopath. Now, when he goes into the house, who does he meet but former Methodist minister, Dean Morehouse, Ruth Ann Morehouse's father. How did this happen? How did Dean Morehouse end up living at Dennis Wilson's house with Dennis Wilson, Charles Manson, and the family of girls, including his young daughter? Well. <laughs> you cannot make this stuff up. Dean Morehouse had a rocky life. There had been some incidences with him and the law, and possibly after his interaction with Charlie and the family and his acid trip, losing his daughter, losing his wife, he decided that maybe these hippies or slippies had the right idea and that you should live life in a more free manner and push away the bounds of society. So he found Manson and the family and uh, basically asked to join. But Manson, who also thought it was weird, so you know it's weird, 
When Charles Manson thinks something is strange, you know it actually is. He wanted to join, but Manson thought it was weird, so he kind of was like, I'm not gonna make you a full member of the family, but you can hang around. And Dennis Wilson actually took a liking to Dean Morehouse and let him stay on as a kind of caretaker, let him live in the guest house and do some odd jobs and landscaping and stuff like that. But it's very strange because now this man, this older man in his 50s, is living in a house where his young underage daughter is doing a lot of drugs and having sex with a lot of different men. It's just a very awkward situation. And Dean Morehouse had his own perverted tendencies. He was actually kind of alienated by the women who were getting sick of him constantly groping them and making advances. And eventually Charlie and the women kind of like shunned him. But at this point, when Tex Watson arrived, Dean Morehouse was still in their good graces. So he was talking to Tex in the kitchen and he was like, listen, there's somebody here you've got to meet. This guy, Charles Manson, he's amazing. So Tex Watson goes into the living room and Charlie is sitting on the floor playing the guitar, surrounded by women. <laughs> and then they all got high. And now according to Watson, this wasn't what drew him into the family. It was the sense of community, not the availability of girls and drugs and the mansion that they all lived in, but the sense of community. He says, here I was accepted in a world I'd never dreamed about, mellow and at my ease. Charlie murmured in the background something about love, finding love, letting yourself love. I suddenly realized that this was what I was looking for. Not that my parents and brother and sister hadn't loved me, but somehow now that didn't count. I wanted the kind of love they talked about in the songs. The kind of love that didn't ask you to be anything, didn't judge what you were, didn't set up any rules or regulations. Yes, Tex, the kind of love given to you by your family, the mother who birthed you, the parents who raised you, that's not real love. This dude sitting on the floor playing a guitar and, and giving you as much LSD as you want, that is love. That's the kind of love the songs are written about. So at this point, Dennis Wilson pretty much knew that Brothers Records was never going to sign Manson, but he still wanted to accommodate Manson and his family as much as he could, even paying for their medical and dental bills, which you can assume were numerous. And he was happy letting things go on as they were, but Manson was not. Things were getting stagnant, nothing was moving forward, and his family, his followers, were becoming too comfortable with Dennis's hospitality. They were enjoying life. They were lounging by the pool. They were living in a mansion where superstars and actresses and actors and singers came over every day. But he didn't want that, did he? He didn't want them to enjoy life and have a good time. When he took them in, they were depressed wrecks. They had no direction. They didn't know what was next. Now, they were having a good time. Because of their initial despair, they turned to him. But happy followers, these happy followers, they may realize that they didn't need him to be happy, to feel something, to have a purpose. That happiness, that contentment with life could potentially make him lose a lot of these followers. And since he wasn't going to get a record deal out of Wilson, and since Wilson wasn't planning on climbing on their boss and becoming a full-fledged member, what was the point in remaining in his life. What Charlie needed was a new distraction, something to refocus his family on their purpose, their real calling, what they stood for, which wasn't lounging around a mansion all day, enjoying running water and meals that didn't have to be taken out of a garbage can. While Susan Atkins was still pregnant in late May, he gave her the task of finding a permanent settlement for their family. Spawn Ranch was great, but it wasn't owned by them. And George Spawn was always kind of getting a little sick of having them there. The locals would get annoyed by the hippies lounging all over the place. Some of the ranch hands would complain about the messes that Manson and his family made. So George kind of flip-flopped back and forth about whether he wanted them there or not. And Manson didn't like that uh, unreliability in where their home base would be. They needed a home base, someplace that they knew, no matter how far they traveled, they could always return to. 
Pat Krenwinkel, Mary, and her little son Pooh Bear, they joined Susan Atkins in their new task, their new goal of finding a headquarters for the family. Now, Susan Atkins was in her glory. Susan had this kind of personality where she really liked being in charge. She liked being bossy. She liked having that power. She was kind of like Manson in that way, but she actually failed miserably at this mission. They rented a place in Philo, California, and the neighbors started calling it the hippie house because the girls who lived there began inviting all the local town's children, most of them minors under the age of 17, to come to the house and party and do drugs and drink alcohol. It wasn't long before the parents of these children began to complain and the police headed over to the hippie house to check it out. When they got there, they found a 17 year old boy on the property, the rental property, experiencing violent delusions from a bad LSD trip. The women were promptly arrested and the baby was put into foster care. Now, Charlie called Bobby Beausoleil and he asked him to go over to Philo and rescue his girls, basically. At this time, Bobby Beausoleil was traveling with his girlfriend, Gail, another woman named Catherine Scher, who everybody called Gypsy, and another woman named Leslie Van Houten. Leslie had been brought up in a suburb of California to middle-class parents who divorced when she was 14. Her father, Paul, was an automotive auctioneer and her mother, Jane, was a school teacher and she had an older brother. After Leslie was born, her parents adopted a young boy and girl that had been orphaned in Korea. But when they divorced in 1963, Paul moved out and the children stayed with Jane. Leslie attended Monrovia High School. She played the saxophone in her marching band and she was elected homecoming queen twice. However, when she discovered LSD and other drugs, her grades began to slip. When she was 17, she ran away from home and she went to the hate. Like most kids her age at this time, she went to the hate because she wanted some sort of guidance, but she didn't find it to her liking. It was overcrowded. It was kind of sad. You know, it was the hate at the time of the free clinic not being able to accommodate everybody's STDs and bacterial infections. So she was like, uh, this isn't for me. When she returned home, she was pregnant and her mother forced her to have an abortion, which Leslie never forgot about. After she graduated from high school, she went to live with her father and she attended business college. She wanted to become a legal secretary, but she also wanted to live in a spiritual yogic community, which I don't know if those two things go hand in hand. I, I'm not sure how many legal secretaries are needed in spiritual yoga communities, but th those were her dreams. Really what she wanted was to leave her family behind forever. She didn't want to have anything to do with any of them anymore. And she visited some friends in San Francisco and that is where she met Bobby Beausoleil and his girlfriend, Gail and Gypsy. And she began traveling with them. What better way to show your family that you're done with them than to climb onto some guy's truck with two other girls and join them on their hippie adventure. Now, Gypsy had met Charlie previously when she was with Bobby because Bobby and Charlie had met in Topanga Canyon a little while back and Gypsy had been with Bobby at that time. And both Leslie and Gypsy could kind of sense that their presence in Bobby's life wasn't really appreciated by his girlfriend, Gail. When Charlie called Bobby and asked for his help getting his girls out of jail, Gypsy told Leslie all about Charlie, what a magnetic figure he was, how powerful he was. Before going over to Philo, they made a stop at Spawn Ranch to talk to Charlie and get an idea of what kind of needed to be done and the details of the situation. When they got there, Bobby, Gail, and Gypsy all got out of the truck, but Leslie didn't. She kind of was feeling a little bit antisocial. She wasn't really interested in meeting new people, so she hung back for a while, but this was the time where she got her first glimpse of Charlie Manson. And she remembered thinking, what's the big deal about this guy? Is this the guy the gypsy said was so magnetic and powerful? He just looks like a short, dirty hippie to me. I don't see anything special about him. She did, however, think that the girls who lived at the ranch were friendly and made her feel, you know, welcome. So she did like that about the Manson family and Spawn Ranch. Not surprising to me, but I'm sure it was surprising to Bobby and Charlie Manson, who probably thought Bobby was just gonna drive over to Philo and snap his fingers and the police were gonna unlock the jail doors and the girls were gonna come out 
and go back with him to the ranch, he was not able to get them out of jail. Why would he be? Why, what, what, what did Charlie think that Bobby Bolsley was gonna do? They ended up spending the summer in jail. After that, they were released on time served. And for some reason, when they got out, Mary was able to get her baby back. They made their way back to Los Angeles and to Spawn Ranch to what I'm sure was a very agitated Charlie Manson. And the idea of finding a more permanent residence was put on hold for now. Now, 1968 was a crazy time. It was full of assassinations, riots, and confusion. After Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, Senator Robert Kennedy was murdered the same night he won California's Democratic presidential primary, June 6, 1968. He had been speaking to journalists and supporters at a televised celebration from the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. And after he exited through a kitchen hallway, he was shot multiple times. Kennedy had been the youth's hope for change. He was compassionate, he was woke. He stood on a platform that include equality for all in the country in opposition to the Vietnam War, a move away from violence and hate towards love and acceptance. The words that he said were everything that the country needed to hear at this time and they especially resonated with the youth of America. They were spending their days and dedicating their lives to fighting for and believing in the same things when they weren't getting high. And as all of this unfolded in the country, Charlie Manson was getting worse. His entitlement, his rights to everything that Dennis Wilson owned was starting to bug Dennis a little bit. The family didn't seem grateful for the life that Wilson had been providing. They just seemed entitled to it and it was never enough. Charlie and his girls used Dennis's credit cards. They took his clothes. They ate his food. They even drove his cars. But they didn't take care of those things or treat them with respect. They basically trashed his home and his $21,000 Mercedes that was uninsured, they totaled it. $21,000 doesn't seem like a lot, but this was the 60s. So today, that car would have been worth over $500,000. Both the Wilson brothers, Brian and Dennis, they had Ferraris. To be more specific, Ferrari 275 GTBs. They loved these cars. Now the Manson family borrowed Brian Wilson's and crashed it. Later, they also borrowed Dennis Wilson's Ferrari 275 GTB and crashed that while driving around downtown LA. Besides the fact that they completely destroyed his belongings. They also gave him gonorrhea. Now, obviously nobody knows who gave Dennis Wilson gonorrhea. Somebody brought it into the family. They all slept together and Dennis slept with multiple of the girls. So somebody gave him gonorrhea and he claimed that all he thought he could do at that point was take the entire family to get penicillin shots because he didn't know who had it or who had given it to him. Wilson said it was probably the largest gonorrhea bill in history. He took them over to an alley clinic and probably paid over a thousand dollars in penicillin. So, I mean, needless to say that they were wearing out their welcome. Charlie was getting agitated with Dennis. Why wasn't he getting signed yet? And Dennis didn't know how to explain to him that even though he believed in him, he couldn't get anybody else to. Wilson, Melcher, and Jacobson had been friends for years. They did a lot of things together. And Manson would get mad when they did things without him, which was usually, they usually did things without him. He didn't understand why he couldn't be considered one of the boys, why he wasn't in their ranks. You know when you meet someone and you fall in love with them, and then one day you wake up and you realize that all the things that you thought you loved about them now annoy the crap out of you? Well, so it went with Wilson and Manson. Manson's determination to Wilson now looked like aggressiveness, and the way he was with the women now seemed a little creepy to Wilson, especially when Manson tried to recruit one of Wilson's girlfriends. Manson would constantly make advances at this girl, even though she made it clear she wasn't interested in having sex with him or being one of his concubines. One of the times that she denied him, Manson pulled a knife on her and told her that he could cut her into little pieces. Even after she told this to Dennis, it kind of scared Dennis a little bit, but he was like, eh, 
That's just Charlie. He's always got a knife on him. He's kind of nuts. He still let Manson and the girls live at his home. And even though Manson made it seem to his followers that he was on the cusp of getting a record deal and becoming famous, he knew, he knew that Terry Melcher was not going to sign him, that he wasn't really impressed with his music. He knew that Dennis Wilson was the only one in his corner, and that wasn't enough. There was a documentary that came out last year. It was called Inside the Manson Cult, The Lost Tapes. And this was actually a documentary crew who followed Manson and his family around at Spawn Ranch. There's over a hundred hours of this footage. If you're interested in seeing this documentary, I liked it. It's narrated by Leif Shriver, who I really like as an actor and I like his voice. And there's a lot of really good interviewees in this documentary. They interview Gypsy, Catherine Cher. They interview Diane Lake, John Douglas, the FBI criminal profiler. He has a lot to say in there as well and it's just very telling. And it's interesting to see them in their natural habitat, like as they were at that time. But in this documentary, they ask Paul Watkins if Terry Melcher thought that Manson was good enough. Paul responds no, and Charlie didn't like that at all. So Manson knew that Terry wasn't like a big fan of the Charlie Manson show. And it was becoming pretty clear that Dennis Wilson didn't have the pull or the authority to get him what he wanted. But Dennis Wilson did try, and he even did set up Charlie and the girls with a recording studio and some time and somebody to produce them. And when Charlie went into a recording studio, it was more clear than ever that he was a fish out of water, that this wasn't his scene, he didn't belong there. He would be instructed, as is typical, if you're recording in a studio, to get closer to the mic or tune his guitar in a different way. And instead of using this as constructive criticism to make the music better, which was what that was for, he took it as a personal attack against him and his music. He put on the airs of a, an established artist when he wasn't. He would come in and you know make everybody wait for him. He would demand things. He would get upset if he wasn't getting the result that he wanted. One night, the session that they were having wasn't going well. And the man who was recording them suggested that they wrap it up for the night. And Charlie didn't like that. He pulled a knife on him. Everybody else besides Manson walked away from these recording sessions knowing not only that he was crazy, but that he just wasn't good enough to make it. But Manson, even after all of this, even after throwing fits, even after pulling a knife on someone, he walked away thinking that he'd killed it. Manson was like Fergie after singing the national anthem at the All-Stars game. Everybody else was confused and he was like, nailed it. He thought that these performances he gave would be sure to snag him a recording contract. However, the only thing that was salvageable from these sessions was the tune Cease to Exist, which Dennis Wilson actually thought was pretty good. He thought it was so good that he decided to take it to the Beach Boys and record it for one of their albums after tweaking it quite a bit and polishing it up, of course, which Charlie didn't know about until the song came out. He had no idea that Dennis Wilson had changed anything about the song. He thought that Dennis had taken the song as is music and lyrics, recorded it, put it on the album, and he was flattered. Now the Beach Boys went on a short tour in the summer of 68, and while Dennis Wilson was gone, the family continued to stay at his house. They also took it upon themselves to use his credit card. That was not his credit card, but his credit card through his record label and they racked up quite a bit of debt. When Wilson returned a week later, he was greeted with questions from his label about how he had managed to spend $800 at a local dairy when he hadn't even been in town. This prompted Dennis to start kind of adding up how much the family had cost him in their brief stay with him during the summer. And the figure that he came up with was over $100,000. And even though he was upset with the credit card thing, with the cars being crashed, with just their general sense of entitlement, he did not want to directly confront Charlie with these transgressions. He still considered them friends, and I think he was a little scared of them. Now you will read reports from people who knew Dennis Wilson who say he was never afraid of Manson, he was never afraid of the family, but I, I don't personally believe that. 
I think if you spend enough time with Manson, as Wilson did, you would have to be a little terrified of his hold over people, of the way he constantly carries around a knife and isn't afraid to threaten people with it. So instead of asking them to leave the house, Dennis just left the house. He gathered up some of his belongings, obviously not everything, and knowing that the lease on the house was gonna be up in a couple weeks anyways, he left. He got a smaller apartment over the Pacific Coast Highway, just big enough for him, not big enough for overnight guests, certainly. And at first he didn't tell Manson and the family where he was because he kind of just wanted to be left alone. And he didn't want to be around when they got kicked out of the house a couple weeks later when the lease was up and the owner of the house was like, you guys have to leave. When they were removed from the home, the family made sure that they took every last thing that Dennis Wilson had to offer. Anything in that house that they could carry, they took with them, including many gold records from the Beach Boys. At this point, they had about 35 followers and they settled onto Spawn Ranch permanently. And when I say permanently, I mean, this is pretty much where they were living, but they still traveled all over the place and looked for other places to stay. Now, Manson had told Tex Watson that he still had too much ego to be a part of the family. And he had to erase all traces of his ego before becoming a full-fledged member. Tex still was not considered a full member of the Manson family. So in order for Tex to prove his worth, to prove that he didn't think he was better than anybody, Manson enlisted him with building these temporary shelters to accommodate their growing population. And Tex Watson, who really wanted to be a part of them, he spent every waking moment tirelessly working to prove to Manson and everybody else that he had sufficiently abandoned his ego enough to be welcomed into their group. Spawn Ranch was a better place for Charlie to have his followers. It was his Guyana, essentially. It was more remote. It was separated from everything. It wasn't Dennis Wilson's house where people were always dropping over and visiting. They didn't have TV. They didn't know what was happening in the outside world. He didn't allow clocks. He didn't allow calendars. He didn't allow watches. He wanted them to kind of just not know anything else that was happening outside besides what he told them was happening outside. Staying at Dennis's had been fun, certainly, and luxurious, but there were so many things going on to take the attention of the family off of Charlie. But here in the desert, he could sit and preach to them for hours and hours and hours, and they pretty much had to listen because there was nothing else to do. Now, the growing membership in the family included Gypsy and Leslie Van Houten, who had grown tired of sitting in Bobby's truck and listening to him and Gail argue constantly. So they decided to go to Spawn Ranch and join up with Charlie. At first, Charlie turned them away and said, no, you can't stay here. He didn't want to upset Bobby, who was still a friend of his, and Gypsy was 20 years old at that time, and he liked his girls a little bit younger, and Leslie was very intelligent, and he usually liked his girls a little dumber. But in the end, he relented. They were both very pretty. Gypsy was very good with people, and he thought that between Gypsy's people skills and Leslie's looks, that they could help him recruit more people. Leslie also served a purpose to Charlie because she'd gone to school to be a secretary, so she had really good writing skills, and he would basically have her follow him around all day long so she could write down song lyrics that he said out loud. He would always get frustrated because he'd always have these brilliant ideas that would pop into his head for songs, and he'd be like, this is the best song ever, but he couldn't really read or write, so he didn't have the ability to take these songs and you know, put them on paper. So he had Leslie follow him around and as he would spout out these lyrics, she would be responsible for writing them down, which was a very frustrating job because oftentimes he would just kind of make these sounds or these series of sounds and then she would be responsible for having to translate the series of sounds into words on the paper. And Charlie had a favorite bedtime story that he would tell his followers. And fairy tales were created to keep children obedient, to keep them from getting into trouble. So Charlie told the story about a king and a queen. The king and the queen had a routine. Every day, the king would ask the queen to make him a sandwich, and she would. But one day, when the king asked the queen to make his sandwich, the queen said she was tired today could he make his own sandwich? 
He said he would, and as he went to go make the sandwich, the queen called after him, hey, you know, while you're there making your sandwich, you think you can make me a sandwich too? Which he did, and he brought her her sandwich. From that day forth, the routine was switched. Now, the king was making his own sandwich and making the queen a sandwich. And that is what women do that they should not do. They try to control men and manipulate them with their femininity. That's why modern society was crumbling because too many men were letting too many women run the show. But the Manson family, they would not fall into that trap. They would not be the parable that he told them. There would be no question about who was in charge, who was there to lead, and who was there to serve. I mean, I looked everywhere for it and I couldn't find any story that was exactly like this. I definitely think he made it up, which is funny because if you're gonna make a story about a king and a queen, you know, you're thinking like medieval stuff, right? Like knights, dragons, castles. I would have said he wanted a, a roasted pig's head every day, not a sandwich. I just don't see like a king and a queen sitting around eating turkey sandwiches. That's just my little criticism of your story, Charlie. Now in September of 1968, Dennis Wilson and the Beach Boys recorded Cease to Exist, but they changed the title to Never Learn Not to Love. He also changed the lyrics, which was a big problem to Charlie, who had told Dennis, you know, if you gotta change the music up, that's fine, but the lyrics need to stay as is. And Dennis Wilson had led him to believe that that's what happened. When Dennis Wilson told Charlie that Cease to Exist or Never Learn Not to Love was going to be on the B-side of their next album, he failed to mention the title change or the lyric change or the fact that Dennis gave himself a full songwriting credit. He figured Charlie would find out later and be mad, but he also figured that he'd already given Charlie and his family over $100,000 worth of his money and belongings and time. So what more could Charlie really ask for? This song was basically a repayment for that. And when Charlie heard the song, he was pissed. But at first he kept his cool because he was still hoping that Dennis Wilson was gonna hook him up with Terry. He was panicking because he had not seen Terry out at clubs or at parties for a while now. And there was a reason that Terry Melcher was laying low and was too busy for Charlie Manson or anybody else. Terry was distracted by some personal issues that his mother, Doris Day, was going through and that he was trying to help her sort through. By the time Doris Day was 27, she was already working on her third marriage. Terry was just seven when Doris married her third husband, Marty Melcher. At this point, Terry's life kind of changed because for the most part, he had been raised by his grandmother because Doris Day was an actress and she was constantly working. So he'd been staying with his grandmother. But when Doris married Marty, they all moved in together, Terry began to live with them and was kind of overwhelmed by the amount of time he was now spending with his mother. Life as he had known it for his entire seven years was completely different. But Doris Day had this vision of a perfect life and a wholesome woman, the kind that she projected to the public, but she never really had been. She wanted to focus on being a good wife and a good mother while still acting and making money. And her new husband, Marty, was also her agent, so it was going to work out perfectly, right? Right? For years, Doris Day would work tirelessly on project after project, movie after movie. And even though people warned her that her husband was funneling money from her, she ignored them. Marty was a good husband, she said. Hadn't he legally adopted her son and given him his last name? Sure, he could be a little controlling and extremely jealous at times, but what man wasn't? She began experiencing panic attacks, which were exacerbated by the fact that she found a lump in one of her breasts. She began throwing herself into religion for comfort and guidance, Christian science religion to be specific which doesn't believe in conventional medicine, instead leaning toward spiritual healing. So she never went to a doctor for her lump or her anxiety issues. Meanwhile, Marty Melcher and his business partner, Jerry Rosenthal, were in fact stealing all her earnings from the movies that she was doing, all of them. 
And Marty was physically and mentally abusive to Terry. He would slap him around and call him a sissy in public to humiliate him. Doris's health just got worse. And even when she was hemorrhaging on set, Marty, who also believed in the Christian science religion, would not let her go to see a doctor. Only when the pain became so bad she could barely stand anymore, he relented and allowed her to check herself in to a hospital. This was when it was discovered that she had a huge intestinal tumor that needed to be removed. And part of this surgery involved a hysterectomy, which broke Doris. She'd always wanted to have more children, and now she knew that she couldn't. This only caused her anxiety and her depression and her emotional issues to become worse. When Terry was 20 years old, he begged his mother to leave the man who had been abusing him for years. When she tried to, Marty told her, that if she left him, she would become bankrupt because he controlled all her money. Terry moved out and Doris and Marty began living separate lives. They slept in different bedrooms. They had their own relationships outside of the marriage, but they remained married. Even though their marriage was over, even though this man had lied to her and stolen from her and treated her and her son poorly, when he became very ill, Doris took care of him. And when he became too sick to be cared for in their home any longer, she stayed with him in the hospital for two weeks. Till one day on April 20th, 1968, Marty Melcher died at the age of 52 from a heart attack. Soon after, while she was still mourning her husband and hiding away from the public eye, Doris Day received something troubling in the mail. It was a tax demand for over $500,000. She had never handled any of her own financials. She assumed everything had been getting paid and she also assumed that she had plenty of money in the bank to cover this tax demand. However, when she checked into it, she found that she had no money in the bank, none. She called her son, now grown and running a business of his own, to help her get to the bottom of it. After they investigated it, they discovered that she was completely broke. Marty and Rosenthal had been embezzling Day's earnings for over 15 years, placing the money in offshore accounts. And when Marty died, all that money became in the control of Jerry Rosenthal. When Manson was looking around for Terry Melcher, trying to get him to listen to his music and give him a shot, Melcher was deeply embroiled in his mother's drama, trying to basically keep her head over water. He was going through her financials and spearheading a lawsuit against Rosenthal, trying to regain some of the money that had been lost. So the recording contract would have to be on hold until Manson could locate Terry. But what would they do in the meantime? What would they talk about? What would their goal be? to keep them distracted, to keep them tired, to keep them following him. Well, Manson had to tell them that something big was coming, something that would unite them against a common enemy, which was Helter Skelter. Now, with all the racial tensions going on, with the riots happening in their own backyard, not to mention all over the country, Manson thought that this would eventually reach ahead. The blacks would eventually get so tired of being oppressed by the whites and being pushed around that they would rise up and nearly every single white person would be murdered. The blacks would then take over the world. It would be a huge war. There would be death and violence and just complete chaos. But in the end, the blacks would win. They would be victorious, but they weren't that smart, right? According to Manson, they weren't that smart. So they would not be able to govern themselves and rule for too long. Where did this leave Manson and his family? Well, they were going to find a bottomless pit in the desert and underneath the bottomless pit, there was an enchanted city where they could all live out their days as they waited for the blacks to tire themselves out trying to run the world. And then they could emerge from the pit ready to step in as world rulers. Now, Charlie said this could take years. This could take hundreds of years for all of this to happen. They needed to be in this pit when the war went down because they couldn't be part of this violence. They couldn't have a chance of something happening to them. So they needed to already be in the pit and it could take hundreds of years for this to all come to a head and for them to be ready to take over. But that was okay because this enchanted city, you didn't age in this enchanted city and you could evolve 
into anything you wanted, like a fairy. Manson theorized that maybe Helter Skelter would start by the blacks breaking into the homes of rich whites and murdering them and maybe writing things on the walls in their blood. But this was coming, regardless of how it would start and how it would end, it was coming and they had to prepare for it. It was February of 1969 when Manson and his family started preparing for Helter Skelter. And Rowan Polanski and his new wife Sharon Tate were also preparing for life changes of their own. Terry Melcher and Candace Bergen had recently broken up and they had moved out of 1005 Cielo Drive. Rudy Altabelli, who was the owner of the home and lived in the guest house and acted as a caretaker, he received a call from Sharon Tate on February 12th asking about the property. She was pregnant, they were going to have a baby and they needed some more space for their growing family. Three days later on February 15th, Sharon and Roman moved into the Cielo Drive property. They thought the place was perfect for all the parties and gatherings they would have there. And Roman was often out of town for work, so there was plenty of room for Sharon's friends to stay so she wouldn't be alone when he wasn't there. Sharon Tate was a gorgeous woman who was very close to her family. Her father had been in the military, so she moved around a lot and learned to make friends quickly wherever she went. Her mother remembers that she had that something special even as a baby saying that strangers used to stop in the streets to stare at little Sharon, and she won her very first beauty pageant at the age of six months, being named Miss Tiny Tot of Dallas, Texas. In 1966, she met Roman Polanski, who was directing the Fearless Vampire Killers. She was suggested for the lead role, and at first Polanski didn't think she was right for it, but after screen testing her, he began to see that she was not only beautiful, but would also be great for the role, so he hired her. During filming, the two got very close, but the problem was that Sharon was already dating someone, celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring. Eventually, the connection between Roman and herself became so undeniable, she knew she had to break it off with Jay. According to reports, Jay understood, but he wanted to meet Roman first to make sure that Sharon, who he did care very deeply for, would be taken care of. The three had dinner, and at the end of it, Jay shook Roman's hand and told him he was a good guy, and allegedly, the three continued a very close friendship in the years after that. Roman and Sharon had a very close and affectionate relationship. She would tell him that he was the better half, and Roman thought that Sharon was too nice and didn't believe in herself enough. She was one of those beautiful women who didn't think she was beautiful, so she remained humble and kind to everyone. Roman tells a story of when he was in his native Poland and he bought a nice pair of shoes, but he was embarrassed to wear the shoes because all his friends had plain shoes. He likened Sharon's beauty to those shoes, that she was almost embarrassed of it. Sharon was cast in Valley of the Dolls, which if you haven't read the book, I enjoyed the book. The movie was not so good, but the book is very interesting and entertaining. Sharon wasn't impressed with the story. She considered it trashy and not the artistic work she really wanted to be doing, and she was right. The movie never really lived up to the book, and the critics never took it seriously. Fun fact, Candy Bergen, who was Terry Melcher's girlfriend at that time, she was also considered for one of the lead roles in Valley of the Dolls, Small World. Roman proposed to Sharon in January of 1968 in their hometown of London, and in late 1968, she was thrilled to discover that she was pregnant, which is what caused them to need a larger home, which is what brought them to Cielo Drive, which Sharon called their love home. Okay, so I think that I'm going to end part three here. There's so much more to cover, guys but we have to keep them at least under an hour and a half or they will take forever to upload. Anyways, I will get part four out to you by this coming week, just a couple of days hopefully. If this goes out on Sunday or Monday, I expect to have part four up by midweek. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Let me know in the comments what you think. I cannot wait to continue this with you guys. I've been having so much fun talking about the Manson family with you, getting into the history, getting into all the details. You know I love this stuff and I'm so glad that you love it too. Have a wonderful day. Stay kind and stay beautiful. She's like a sickness Bye. in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way of